So first thing I always do is find out who in here, by show of hands, has done alpha. Oh, wow, really good chunk. And then one final question. Who became a Christian on alpha? Interesting, that's cool. It's, who over there? Yeah, awesome. That's so great. Well, um, I've already introduced myself a little bit. Um, and how I get here, and it's such a privilege to do my job. And I would say my favorite part of my job is, I'm essentially a professional coffee drinker is what I do for a living. Um, but my favorite part of my job is hearing stories of people who've come to faith on Alpha. So I've just got a really quick video of actually one of my colleagues uh, who became a Christian on Alpha. Growing up, I didn't have a faith. Um, I kind of come from a Catholic community. My idea of faith didn't really, I didn't really have an idea of faith. I just did it because I was taken to those things. But this guy who I met at university constantly just seemed to inwardly kind of have everything together and outwardly was having a great time. And he said it's because he has a faith and um, because of his relationship with Jesus. He then invited me to Alpha. But then on the third week, I decided to go. And kind of sat in the car, was like, made sure there was enough people that looked like me that went into the building. But the week I came was the forgiveness week. Um, and I really struggled with forgiveness. It's something that's been really difficult in my life. But I had this moment of, like, God forgives me for everything. And it just that, that of like, wow, that, like, that unconditional love that, that God forgives me. So I'd gone from like trying to wrap my head around like, the fact that God forgives me to then like, a, like my heart being like, Jesus loves me and that Jesus is with me. I just need to say yes to him. But most importantly, I have a purpose that Jesus walks with me every single day and that I am loved unconditionally. And that, that just blows my mind and I have to remind myself of that every day. But because I was invited to Alpha, I was able to have asked those questions and um, have those moments of like pondering about these questions of life and faith and what it means to know Jesus. My life has been completely changed and I walk every day with purpose. It's such a good story, but one thing that he doesn't say on it is that his friend spent five years inviting him to Alpha. <laughs> five years it took. And um, last year I was with a church in Cheshire and... Uh, uh, I was doing a similar message to this, and they got four people up on the stage to share their story of how they came to faith through Alpha. And uh, there was one woman who was in a shelter, and they made a food hamper, and it had an invite to Alpha. But well, there's this one guy, and it stuck with me ever since, because he stood up at the front, and he went, I was invited to Alpha six times. I did not want to go. I didn't care about church. I, every time, I just was like, why are you inviting me to this? And then on the seventh time, I didn't have an invitation, but I just showed up anyway. And that's the power of an invitation. By you inviting someone, you bring someone closer to Jesus. And in some cases, they end up serving in church. They end up running an alpha course. But what a privilege it is that you get to do that invitation. And um, do you want to hear some stats? Because I do love a bit of stats um, for alpha. Um, last year, 30,000 churches and organizations ran an alpha course with just over 1.3 million people doing an Alpha course just last year. We reckon, since Alpha has started, that 30 million people have done an Alpha course, which is just incredible that we get to be part of such a global organization, that we participate in something that happens all across the world, in every denomination, in over 100 countries and 112 languages. It's just incredible. Um, but... I love serving on Alpha. We've actually just finished our Alpha course at our church. And uh, we had a guy on the course, and uh, on, on, actually on the forgiveness week, he, uh, Nikki prays at the end. He says, if you want to become a Christian, just echo this prayer in your heart. And I, beforehand, I said to the team, I said, you never know, someone might become a Christian tonight. And they might just pray that prayer. Not thinking anything of it, we get to the small group discussion, and I said, so what did you think? How did you find it? What stood out to you? And he went, well, I just prayed that prayer and I'm not sure what to do now. And I thought, oh gosh, okay, great. Let's talk about it. Um, but it is absolutely a privilege uh, to work for Alpha. And, uh, but because we're an evangelistic charity, it's always interesting when you go to a church and um, we start talking about evangelism because everyone has some opinion of what evangelism is. Personally, I've always had a bit of a love-hate 
relationship with evangelism. Uh, before Nathan and I got married, I lived in a flat. I lived on the fourth floor. And my, par- my parking space was just outside of the window of person on the ground floor. And we often had a bit of a chat. More often than not, it was at the window smoking. So we always had a good little, hi, how are you doing? Kind of, how's your day? And then one day he turned to me. I was tired. I just wanted to go upstairs. I did not want to stand out in the cold. And he turned to me and went, what do you actually do for a job? Because you always come in at really random hours. And I thought, oh, God, I don't want to have this conversation today. I don't want to do evangelism today. So I thought, right, I I know. I'm a relationship manager. And he's like, oh, cool. What kind of relationship manager? And I think, oh, I work for a charity. And he goes, oh, what charity? And I go, oh, we do this course. He goes, what course? (laughs) I'm thinking, oh, I'm actually going to have to have this conversation with him now, aren't I? And uh, anyway, from a moment where I didn't want to do evangelism, I didn't want to talk about Jesus, because my job will always lead to talking about Jesus. But in the end, we ended up having a 45-minute chat about his faith, about where he'd come from, his experience of church. I ended up inviting him to church and to Alpha. I don't know if he ever went because I I moved to Nathan's church. Um, But I still pray for him. I still hope that he shows up. And knowing that maybe he's that I was like the sixth invitation. Or maybe I was the first invitation. You never know. But that's the power of an invitation. And we're all called to do it. Um, Have you ever Googled what evangelism is? I wanted to know what the original Greek was, which is to bring good news. But what I found was absolutely hilarious. One of the top results was, what does evangelism mean? It's a word that Christians are scared of. (laughs) It's true, isn't it? Like, we all have a funny relationship with it. So what we've done is we've decided to call it invitational culture instead. So hopefully it will... uh, If you do not like the word evangelism, maybe you'll like invitational culture. But we've all heard of the Great Commission, and it's going to magically come up on the screen now, I hope. Always do this. I was at um, an event, and Nikki Gumbel came up to to Birmingham, and I said, oh, let's um, put this video on the screen, just have a chat while we get set up for the next bit. It didn't show up, so we're in a room with all these people, and I go, we all know what it's like. The screen never works in church when you want it to, but luckily, I can see that it's up now. So the Great Commission, it says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You know, when we talk about evangelism, this is probably the most famous verse that comes up. We're all called to do it. It's part of all of our discipleship journey that we are called to go and make disciples. We're called to go and do evangelism. But what I love about this, and I've highlighted it in bold, it says, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You know, we don't have to do our evangelism on our own. Often we feel like we're going out and we're taking that big step and we're being really bold. But Jesus says, I've gone before you. I've never left you. You're joining in with what I'm already doing. And what a comfort that is for when you do your evangelism is that you're not on your own. You don't have to have that awkward moment. Is Jesus is right there with you. So I'm going to move on and we're going to read from Luke 5, verse 17 to 26. So if you've got Bibles, you can do that, but I'm doing mine from my phone as well. And it says, One day Jesus was teaching, and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some men carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up to the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. When they saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to them, to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up and take your mat and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. 
I always bring up my water in here. It's a completely dis distraction because I thought, oh, I'm a bit thirsty now. But I always think, can I bring up my Diet Coke with me? Like, everyone always seems to bring up their water, don't they? Anyway, I love this story. And it's great that we're talking about healing this morning and we've been praying for it because this story is about healing. But what strikes me about this is often when I hear this story, we hear about, like, the, the willingness and the urgency of the man who wants to be healed. But in, I do kids' church, so anyone in here is an absolute hero if you serve on kids' church. I love this story because it's so cool when you try and explain, like, somebody was lowered through the roof. Imagine, like, knocking through the roof and let, lowering them through. But I always think, in the Bible, we always talk about how, well, not in the Bible, in kids' church, we always say it was their friends who brought them. But if you actually look at the Bible, it says some men. Some men brought them, brought the guy brought him to the feet of Jesus and then Jesus did what only he could do he healed and he forgave and just think right now for you and for me who am I bringing to the feet of Jesus that Jesus could do what only he could do because it's our responsibility to do that it's our responsibility to bring people as close as they possibly can be to Jesus and then Jesus will do what only he can do but like I said it doesn't just say his friends did it. It was some men. So it doesn't have to be just your friends and family who you bring into Jesus. It could be your neighbors who you don't know that well. You know how many times I've actually been stopped on the street and somebody's asked me a question about faith? It's completely random. I have never, ever had that before. But I said to God, I said, okay, God, show me some people. Show me who you want me to talk to. And I've, sometimes he goes, well, there's somebody who you've been speaking to for 10 years and you've never invited them to Alpha. But then sometimes somebody random on the street comes up to me and says, what's that conference that you're going to? It actually happened in Harrogate. I was at a conference. And there were probably about 300 people on the street. And he somehow managed to stop me and ask me about it. I was like, well, why don't you go to Alpha at that church? I can see they've got a sign on their wall. Um, and I don't know, maybe you did go to Alpha. Um, but I sometimes think, you know, it's not just enough to actually do that invitation to Alpha. Sometimes we actually have to invite them to know who Jesus is for themselves. I've, uh, I've heard so many messages, and you've probably heard the same, on why we should do evangelism. But I want to know how do we do evangelism? Because we all hear the encouraging stories of, you know, go and make disciples of all nations. This is what could happen. But I've always been at a loss of, what happens if I don't know the answer to the question? Like that's the biggest thing for me. The scariest thing is, what if they ask me something I don't know the answer to? And we feel like we have to have a, like a theology degree to be able to explain it in a really great way. But actually, if you look at how Jesus did evangelism, who wasn't like that. So there's six things that Jesus did that I want to talk through today that hopefully you'll be able to go out and go, okay, maybe I can give this a go. So... He, we pray, we listen, we ask questions, we share our testimony, we clarify the gospel, and we make that invitation. And you're probably looking at these going, gosh, they're not like out of this world, most amazing points you've ever heard. But actually, for me, even for me in my evangelism, this really helped me because it simplified how we do it. So the first thing is pray. You know the Lord's Prayer, it says, Our Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. Before I go out and do evangelism, I would always pray that prayer. God, your kingdom come, your will be done. Guide me to the people you're already working with. But not only is prayer useful for before you do evangelism, it's actually a useful tool for evangelism. So Jesus, before they even had a relationship with them, he healed people, he set people free. He restored relationships. He changed mindsets. That's what Jesus did before they even had a relationship. And we have the opportunity to do that too. We've recently done a, done a study. I don't know if you've heard of it. Some of you might have done. It's called Talking Jesus. It came out in 2015 the first time. And we've just brought it out again this year. And it's quite a few different evangelistic organizations. But one of the, the questions they were looking at when they've surveyed, I think it was a couple of thousand people, is um, how many people are open to a spiritual experience? In 2015, it was one in five people were open to a spiritual experience. But this year, one in three people are open to a spiritual experience, which means one in three people are open to being prayed for. How incredible is that? That you can just simply say, you know, when somebody says, oh, my, my neck's really sore. You say, oh, can I pray for you? One in three people are going to say yes. And sometimes one in three people say, 
yes, or they say, oh, I don't want to do it right now. I don't want you to pray for me right now. But that's fine, you can go home and do it. I was talking to a guy once and he said his best tool for evangelism is his dogs and his tattoos. His tattoos, because people always ask the meaning behind. But he said his dog is a great tool for evangelism. He says every day he does the same loop around his uh, local green area. And um, people always come and stop by the dog. They always come and say hi. And uh, he always says to people, he says oh, we're just out here prayer walking. Admittedly, I'm doing more praying than he is, but is there anything I can pray for you for? And he's, he has found that he's had so many incredible opportunities to pray for people and to speak to people about God because he's just offered prayer, just simply. And, you know, people say no and they walk on, but he's had people he's prayed for right then and there for healing, people he's brought to Jesus in those moments just because he's offered it. And, you know, imagine in your everyday life, you know, I don't have a dog. <laughs> Not yet. But is there, anything, is there anything in my life that I can use for my evangelism? Is there any way that I can share prayer with people? That I can offer healing? That I can offer to pray for that? But what I would say is if you're going to offer to do it, make sure you do go home and pray. Because they might think, oh, God's not answered my prayer. But actually, it might just be that we never prayed. And that's a big challenge for me. I go, yeah, 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 I pray. And then I go home and totally forget. So I always try and write it down to make sure I do actually pray. The next one is listening. Uh, in school, I was always told that you have two ears and one mouth. I am a particularly chatty person. I do just like to talk. I was born this way. It's just how I am. But I uh, often, with my job, do lots of driving. So I'll come home and uh, I'll speak to Nathan. And he goes, you've just spoken straight for the last 45 minutes. You can tell you've been on your own. I can't get a word in. And uh, my challenge for me, and this is a very big one for me, is to make sure that I'm, I'm listening. I heard this quote recently from a podcast and it said, are you listening to talk or are you listening to understand? I'll say it again. Are you listening to talk or are you listening to understand? I think so often we feel in evangelism that we have to tell people everything, that we have to have it perfectly worded. But actually, listening is a great tool for evangelism because it shows people that you're interested in them. And I don't know about you, have you ever been with someone who you feel like they're not even listening to you, they're just waiting to get their next phrase in? I never want to be that person. I want to be a person who is listening to understand what they're saying and responding accordingly, not trying to get my agenda forward. And I think in evangelism, some people have had a bad experience with it, where they've just been shouted at and told what to do. But if you can show that you listen, Jesus listened to people. And actually, it goes quite well into the next one, which is questions. Jesus asked 307 questions, but only answered 183 questions. So he asked so many more questions than he answered. Can you imagine if you flipped your evangelism around, instead of telling people what to do, you flipped it around and you asked people questions. So, for example, Dan, I would ask you, what's the most important thing in your life right now? <laughs> Your family. But how easy is it then? I mean, obviously, you wouldn't just randomly walk up to someone and ask that question. But in, when you're talking to someone, asking those kind of questions and saying, what's the most important thing? Most people I've ever asked, and I do put lots of people on the spot to do this, say family or their husband or their children. But how easy is it to talk about the family of God? That you're welcome here every single Sunday? That you are adopted into a family? That even if you feel like you've not got an earthly family, you've got a spiritual heavenly family? And how easy is it for just a simple segue into that? Asking questions is it's really important. My father-in-law, Paul, he is great at asking questions. When, when I first started dating Nathan, he was quite intense with his questions. I thought, gosh, does he not like me? I genuinely, I thought, gosh, he's asking me a lot. But I realized he was just interested. He just wanted to get to know me. But not only does he ask the questions right in the moment, he'll remember what I've answered. And then a couple of months later, he'll ask me again. He is so intentional with his questions. And it goes back to showing that you're interested, showing that you care about someone. The next one is testimony. In 1 Peter 3, verse 15, it says, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. Do you know why you put your hope in God? 
Do you reckon if somebody asked you that question, you could share it really simply, really concisely? Everyone always talks about that two-minute elevator pitch. I always think, that doesn't work, does it? Because the door always pings open on the next floor, doesn't it? You never get a full ride all the way up with one person anyway. But there's three questions in order to share the impact of God in your life that you can ask. What was my life like before Jesus? How did I meet Jesus? And what's my life like now? And I always find if you can answer those three questions as simply as you can when somebody asks you, you know, when, at, when you're in work in the week and you say, what are you doing this weekend? You go, oh, I'm actually going to church. And they go, oh, you go to church? I get it all the time. You go to church? I go, yeah, let me tell you why I go to church. And it, how easy is it then to just share your testimony? Often I go, oh, I'm not up to anything this weekend. Because church is just a regular part of what I already do. But it's another easy, simple way. And it also tells people that you're open to having a conversation about faith. But it's not just enough to share your testimony. Because something that God does in my life isn't necessarily what he's going to do in your life. You know, in my life, it might be breakthrough in financial area. But for you, it might be your mental health. Or for you, it might be a restoration in a family member. Whatever it is, God does something different in everyone's life. So we have to clarify the gospel, which is the next one. In Isaiah 55, verse 12, it says, God's word will not return to me empty. They make the things that happen that I want to happen, and they succeed in doing what I send them to do. We should never underestimate the power of God's word and his truth to do what he intends for it to do. My granddad, um, one Sunday morning, he was walking along the street, and the church doors were open. And he just heard the word of God being read. And in that moment, he decided he wanted to give his life to Jesus. He never went back to that church. But because they were preaching the word of God, he gave his life to Jesus. You know, just simply sharing a Bible verse with someone could change someone's life. But for us, we do have to clarify the gospel. We do have to ask those questions of who is God? Who is Jesus? What's the problem? What's the solution and what now? To be honest, most of those things do happen on Alpha. Um, so you can, if, some, if you need to clarify it in that sense, you can always say, come along to Alpha when they ask who is Jesus or why did Jesus die? Literally the second and third weeks are titled those. Um, but what a great opportunity is when you get to share and clarify the gospel. And if you don't feel like you can answer those questions, that's a great time to dig into your Bible and try and understand them or come along to, is it called Spaces? Yeah, come along to Spaces and learn together with one another and challenge each other in that way and the last one is invitation I was reading about um, the blind man and Jesus said do you want to be well in other parts of the bible Jesus says come and see with Jesus there is always an invitation and in here some of you most of you probably have already accepted that invitation to know Jesus but for other people, it's our opportunity to ask them, to present that invitation to them. And often, like when you're talking about Jesus, I found myself saying, what do you think of that? But what, ha what would you do if you flipped the question to say, what's stopping you from having a relationship with Jesus? Because they'll either go, this, 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 and this, and you'll go, okay, come along to Alpha. <laughs> no, or you could say, oh, let's go for a coffee. Let's go out for dinner. Have we got any foodies in here? Anyone who loves food? If you ever needed an excuse to go out for dinner, Jesus is the ultimate example of this. Jesus was always either going to a meal, coming from a meal, or at a meal. So if you needed any excuse to do evangelism over food, you go for it. Jesus has given you permission. But if you ask that question, what's stopping you from accepting Jesus? Sometimes somebody might just say, nothing. And you get the privilege to pray that prayer with someone. I think that's probably one of the greatest privileges I've ever had is to pray with someone as they've accepted Jesus into their life. And in Revelation 3 verse 20, it says, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. You know, he's knocking for you, for me, for people out there. And in, our, in the Alpha videos, every time, always makes me really emotional, was the painting by William Holman. 
And it depicts this Bible verse. And it's like Jesus is knocking on the door. And somebody said to me, said, there's no handle. You've missed a bit. And he replied and he said, there's no handle because the handle's on the inside. Jesus isn't going to force his way through. He's waiting for you to open the door. I'd love if you just close your eyes for a second. We've heard so many incredible words about coming closer to God, about healing. I just want to give you another opportunity to do that. I'm going to read the verse again. It says, Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. I'm just going to pray the ancient prayer of the church, which is come Holy Spirit, and see what God wants to do. Whether there are still people in here who want healing, I want to pray for you. If you feel like you've never accepted that crucial invitation to come and see Jesus, to come and have a relationship with him, and I want to give you that opportunity. If today you've been thinking about the people in your life who you could do evangelism with, who you could share about Jesus with, I'd love to pray for that as well. I'm going to pray, come Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, would you come and meet with us? I pray we'd be open to hear. God, would you reveal yourself to us? Would you give us words, pictures, verses? God, for the people in here who have accepted you into their life, God, I pray that you would reveal one or two people who they can share with you, who they can make that invitation to. God, I pray for a boldness in that. 